This is Dr. Steve Cheney, and my topic for today is the truth about protein supplements. You know there's a lot of hype and misinformation out there about protein supplements, so my advice to you is to question what you've been told, or put another way, you may want to rethink what you've come to believe. My first question to you is, where did you get that information from? Was it from your friends? And if so, what is their training? Are they scientists? Do they know how to interpret scientific articles? Where did they get their information? Was it from other friends or their high school coach? And, you know, if they're just sharing their experiences with you, they're probably sharing them with the utmost conviction. But what you need to know is the placebo effect with sports nutrition products is way over 50%. And then there are all those magazines out there. I call a muscle magazine. I've, I've kind of made that up. I don't know if there really is a muscle magazine, but if there were, its byline would probably be all the latest hype, or we never let the facts get in the way of a good story. And then there are the blogs and the websites that you sometimes go to for information. And once again, with both those magazines and blogs and the websites, you have to ask about the authors. What is their training? Are they scientists that know how to interpret scientific articles? You know, even if they're medical doctors, they may not be trained at interpreting scientific articles. You need to ask, what are their biases? What are they selling? And are they cherry picking their sources? You know, quite often you'll all find that the blog or website or the magazine article will highlight the one or two studies that seem to suggest an ingredient or product works, but they'll ignore all the other dozens of studies that show that it doesn't work. And you know, if the message you're getting from your magazine or your blog or your website is always spectacular, you know, if it's always spectacular, it can't always be true. And you know, if it sounds too good to be true, well, you should go back, go back to the old adage and it probably isn't true. So let's start with carbohydrate. I call this the myth of carbohydrate because you see, Many protein supplements out there have little or no carbohydrate. And, on the, and you know, so on the one hand, that sort of seems like a no-brainer. After all, you're trying to get a protein supplement. You want to increase your muscle mass. You're not interested in carbohydrate, or are you? You see, there's a fact that's been known to biochemists for, for decades. And that is that when the carbohydrate content of a meal or a protein supplement is low, some of that protein is going to be converted to glucose to keep your blood sugar levels constant. And all of the protein that's being converted to glucose isn't being used to build muscle. So there's a concept called protein sparing. You want enough carbohydrate in your protein so it, the carbohydrate will be used to keep your blood sugar levels high and all of the protein can be used to build muscle. And you know what you want. What you're looking for here is about a one-to-one -one ratio of carbohydrate to protein. You can have more, but if you have significantly less, you're going to be using some of that protein in that supplement just to keep your blood sugar levels up, not to build muscle mass. And you know one of the reasons why some of these uh, protein supplements are so low in sugar, are so low in carbohydrate, is that many companies prefer to use artificial sweeteners and flavors. Partly that's to save money, but partly it's, to, it's for taste. It's, it's a convenient way to cover up the taste of branch chain amino acids and a lot of the other additives that they put in their protein supplements. Now you don't need to do that. And if you've listened to my The Truth About Sugar and Artificial Sweeteners, you'll know I'm not a fan of using artificial ingredients. They all have risk and they really have no proven benefits. So, you know, I would tend to avoid that. It's a little bit more costly, it's a little bit harder, but you can get natural products without any artificial ingredients um, that, that, you know, will have branch chain amino acids and some of, those other, uh, some of those other ingredients that you find in the protein supplements. Now, after workout protein products are a special case. And I'm talking about the protein product you might take immediately after a workout. Because here, what you're trying to do is to maximize the insulin response. Because insulin is actually that master hormone that drives the replenishment of the energy stores, the, the rebuilding of the glycogen stores in your muscle tissue, and also drives the rebuilding of muscle tissue itself. 
and there's a two to four hour window of maximum insulin sensitivity immediately after exercise. Of course, the most sensitivity is immediately after the exercise and it tapers off with time. But, you know, as close to immediately after exercise as possible is when you're going to see the maximum amount of that insulin sensitivity. And so what you want to do immediately after exercise is you want to add the right amount of carbohydrate to your protein supplement to maximize that insulin response. Because if you do that, that's going to maximize the glycogen stores and it's going to maximize that increase in muscle mass that occurs immediately after the exercise. Uh, and there is a ton of research out there showing that the right ratio of carbohydrate to protein for that purpose is somewhere between 2.5 to 1 and 4 to 1. You know, it's, it doesn't matter anywhere within that range is going to work, but there are a lot of companies out there that seem to completely ignore this research when they design their after-workout protein products. Now, there's another question that you need to be asking yourself, is how much protein should be in that supplement? Well, one of the things we know is that training increases the overall protein needs. Um, so, you know, the, what many experts recommend is that protein in grams would be about half the weight in pounds for somebody that's involved in a rigorous exercise program. So that would be about 80 grams for a 160 pound man or 60 grams for a 120 pound woman. That's about one and a half times the usual RDA, but remember, we're talking about, you know, pretty serious training here. And but the other question I think is more important to your mind is how much protein do you need after a workout? Well, young adults will do fine with about 15 grams of protein, but older adults may need 20 to 30 grams of protein, but not too much protein. You see, there's some protein supplements out there that don't have enough. They have less than 15 grams. But there's some protein supplements out there that seem to think the more the better. Well, there's another sort of limitation because we have a limited ability to utilize protein in a single meal or serving. 30 grams of protein per meal or per serving is about the maximum effect in terms of, re in terms of that protein actually being used to build muscle mass. So what you really want to, want to aim for is about 20 to 30 grams of protein at every meal. Or, you know, if you really, really want to maximize it, you'd, you'd sort of uh, spread that out a little bit and have that protein every three to four hours. Now, the other question is what kind of protein? You know, you've got lots of choices out there. And the whey protein products are the ones that are most rapidly utilized. So whey protein is rapidly digested. The protein is rapidly absorbed into the bloodstream, and that helps to optimize the insulin response after exercise. You see that maximum insulin response occurs not just with the carbohydrate, but it's the amount and ratio of carbohydrate to protein. So you need that protein in there as well as the carbohydrate, and you want a protein that gets into the bloodstream quickly. So that's whey protein. So that's your best choice for immediately after exercise. Now, soy protein and casein are, are more slowly utilized. So they have a, what we call a low glycemic index. They have a very small effect on blood sugar levels. So they're best used for diet products. They're also the best choice for, you know, sometime later. So you've, you've taken a whey protein product immediately after exercise. You're maximizing that insulin response to, to maximize that immediate recovery, that immediate increase in muscle mass. But now you want to sustain that muscle, that increase in muscle mass over a longer period of time. This is where you use the soy protein or casein product. Um, and it, it, we'll talk about leucine later, but that's going to be especially beneficial if it's coupled with leucine. Now let's talk about some of the other stuff that's put in these protein supplements. I'm going to, you know, I call this the good, the bad, and the dangerous. Well, you know, you probably pretty much know those sports supplements that are dangerous or illegal. Steroids and amphetamines, of course, you know about. Ephedrin, ephedra, mawang, still used occasionally, but not so much. Um, what we found, and you've, you've, most of you probably know this already, is while it increases your alertness, 
These ingredients have no effect on performance. They increase blood pressure and they increase heart rate. And yes, they actually kill people. So those are things that are dangerous. They're not illegal, but they're dangerous. And then there's DHEA and other pro-hormones. And you know, one of the reasons why we avoid the steroid hormones to begin with is because they increase cancer risk. And so DHEA, yes, it will increase your muscle mass, but it's also an immediate precursor to those steroid hormones. And there is an increased cancer risk associated with DHEA use. Uh, so, you know, when you see these uh, supplements that are called, you know, they're designed called pro-hormones, um, you probably want to avoid them because if they are actually efficiently converted to the hormones, you're going to have the same risks as you would with the hormones themselves. Growth hormone is another example. You really don't want to be using growth hormone unless it's under a doctor's supervision because, because again, growth hormone stimulates the growth of cancer cells. So yeah, if you're in your teens, maybe, but if you're an adult uh, where we start to accumulate cancer cells, we really don't want to be fooling around with things like growth hormone, DHEA, um, and those sorts of things. So, you know, those amino acids and so forth that are claimed to increase growth hormone or to give rise to DHEA, you know, those are things that if they actually work, which fortunately most of them don't, um, I would say avoid those as well. Now, let's talk about, those are the dangerous ones, the one to clearly avoid. Let's talk about the sports supplements that you'll find in a lot of products out there that really are of little value. Ribose is one. Um, and the interesting thing is, in, in all of these cases, you will find that they have some very limited use, limited medical uses. So ribose is something that's been clinically shown to protect heart muscle in patients with heart disease. So, you know, I guess it was an immediate extrapolation for protected heart muscle in patients with heart disease. Well, obviously it's going to be effective for somebody that's exercising, but actually the clinical studies have shown no exercise benefit in healthy individuals. That's a product that clearly doesn't work. Inosine is another one I've seen in some products. And again, there are some clinical studies currently ongoing to see if it might help in patients with spinal cord diseases. But again, the clinical studies that have been done in healthy individuals and looking at their effect, its effect on exercise have shown no benefit. So again, that's another one that doesn't work. And then there's carnitine. And that's something that helps in carnitine deficiency diseases, congestive heart failure. But, you know, clinical studies show there's no exercise benefit of carnitine in healthy individuals. And in fact, with most of the products that are in the marketplace, the carnitine is not even taken up by the muscle cells. Again, another product that clearly doesn't work. Um, then there's arginine and citrulline. Well, again, these are the, again there's, a, there's specific medical conditions where it may be a, they may be a benefit. Um, they they increase levels of nitric oxide, and that may be helpful for patients with say pulmonary hypertension but they actually decrease the growth hormone response that naturally occurs following exercise. So, you know, that actually interferes with some of the positive increase in muscle mass you see after, after exercise. And the, the clinical research shows they may have a modest benefit in untrained subjects. So if you're just starting your exercise program, you might get a modest benefit from arginine or citrulline. But if you're a trained athlete, if you've been in that training program for a few months, um, there's no, the clinical studies show there's no exercise benefit of arginine and citrulline in trained subjects. So again, that's a product that's a very limited benefit for exercise. Only if you're just getting started in your exercise program is it possibly of a slight benefit. HMB is another very interesting ingredient, uh, and it's been well studied. There are now over 30 published clinical studies, and about half of them show some positive results. Half of them show, half of them are negative, show no beneficial effects. And again, the story is pretty much the same. If you actually sort those out, and there are a number of recent reviews that have done that, 
It looks like there may be a modest benefit in untrained subjects, but no exercise benefit in trained subjects. And that's one you have to be a little bit care careful of because excessive use can lead to confusion and memory loss. So again, that's a product of very limited benefit. Now, there are a few sports supplements that do appear to work that I actually recommend. One is creatine. That's something that's widely used. It does give a modest improvement of high power output. So it's great for weightlifters and those sorts of, uh, those sorts of athletes. It's something that has no measurable effect on endurance. So if you're a marathoner, no, it's probably not going to help you much. Um, you, you probably already know that high doses can cause dehydration and muscle cramping. So you want to be sure that you keep adequately hydrated if you're going to use creatine. And rather than get creatine, rather than get a protein supplement with creatine and other stuff in it, playing, paying a lot of extra money, my advice would be to get pure creatine monohydrate. You can get it in bulk, it's inexpensive, and just add that to your favorite protein drink. You also need to remember that creatine is not for everybody. There's some people who can't use it um, because they get the cramping and even when they try and hydrate themselves. And it's not generally recommended for young athletes. The other sports supplements that really do work are the branch chain amino acids. And that's because muscle is rich in branch chain amino acids and they're actually used for energy during exercise. But of the branch chain amino acids, it turns out that leucine does most of the heavy lifting. So the others play peripheral roles. It's leucine that's really important. And that's because leucine is absolutely unique among the amino acids in, in that it specifically sig signals the muscle to make protein and retain protein. So the clinical studies show that it helps retain muscle mass during dieting and helps increase muscle mass following exercise. The amount of leucine matters. You need about 1.7 grams uh, if you're a young adult after your workout. Older adults may need up to three grams after a workout. And again, if I look at a lot of the sports supplements out there, many of them just have maybe a couple hundred milligrams of leucine. That's something that looks good on the label, but it's not really going to give you a workout benefit. But the overall design of the program of the product is important as well. It's not just the leucine, it's the amount of protein, it's the amount of the carbohydrate protein ratio. All of that's important in how well that leucine is going to work in terms of increasing muscle mass. So you want to demand that the manufacturer or the company has, has published clinical studies. They can provide you with published clinical studies showing that their product actually works and actually increases muscle mass following exercise or maintains muscle mass when you're dieting. So that's it. If we sum it all up, immediately after your workout, your best strategy is to optimize the insulin response. And your best choice to do that would be a whey protein supplement with a fair amount of carbohydrate in it, somewhere between 2.5 to 4 to 1 ratio. Now, later after a workout or in a diet product, your best strategy, now you want to sustain and maintain that increase in muscle mass. Here your best choice would be soy protein or casein. You want some carbohydrate there and added leucine can be very beneficial in this kind of product. And again, as I said before, demand proof that the product works and avoid the artificial ingredients. And most of all, don't fall for the hype. Leucine and creatine are a proven value, but you can pretty much forget the rest. Thank you for joining me.